it has been a wonderful couple of months here in Boston so far. I've had a whale of a time uh, in the archive here at Barnes Library. It's been a pleasure to have space and time to think and write. And uh, wonderful students to bounce ideas off of what have been based here. Uh, I want to just record my thanks to Christian Dupont, who is a, a gentleman, as so you will already know, uh, and has been extraordinarily helpful, as has his staff, uh, Andrew Pistoro, Kathleen Monaghan, uh, Catherine Fox, uh, and of course Kathleen Williams, who is here tonight, uh, who I met the first time I came here. So I also want to thank the History Department and Sarah Ross uh, for graciously welcoming me here, uh, along with the Irish Studies faculty, uh, some of whom have bothered to come here tonight, which I greatly appreciate, given uh, the election cycle and the weather and all the other inclement factors. Uh, I also want to thank James H. Murphy, who has been a mentor of mine since early in my PhD, uh, a resource as he has been for so many young scholars of the 19th century uh, in Ireland. Uh, and I want to thank him for his many years of help and advice. So, uh, that all done, it falls to me to talk about uh, a Dublin love affair in the 1840s. Uh, this is a project I've been working on with a really talented 19th century historian based at Dublin City University called Juliana Edelman, who's a collaborator of mine. Uh, and indeed, the person who first brought this Trinity based manuscript uh, to my attention a couple of years ago, 2015, 2016. Uh, we've been working on this very slowly for the last couple of years, transcribing uh, a great big diary of about 620 odd pages. Um, and one of the key themes that has emerged, sort of in tandem, I suppose, with a theme that has emerged in popular culture in the last three years, uh, a theme that has emerged as central, a central plank within that diary, is the question of love and consent and power within relationships, uh, which has really become something that we're all interested in. So I'm going to begin with a fairly hard-hitting quote by Catherine McKinnon, who's a famous feminist legal scholar uh, from, the, from the 1980s. Many of you already know very well. And McKinnon raises here uh, a sort of classic question of feminist theory, uh, the extent to which we can argue for female consent in the patriarchal world. She argues that men, women, it's a distinction, not just a difference, but of power and powerlessness. Power and powerlessness is the sex difference. Well, McKinnon belonged to a group of uh, radical feminist theorists, and her work is generally considered to be at the uh, extreme end of the spectrum when it comes uh, to questions of power within feminist theory, as if she has quite political things to say about it. Um, feminist scholars have long argued against the idea. Uh, the shift in kin negotiating, companionating, pragmatic marriage patterns in the early modern period to more individuated, choice based marriages centered on romantic love and mutual attraction, physical and otherwise, in the modern period, in any way led to uh, an increase in female power, autonomy, and agency, or equality in relationships more broadly defined. Uh, it has always been assumed that they have. But feminist theorists, theorists uh, theorist in particular, have argued against this idea. Um, for Martin and others, to give consent, the very idea that you give consent to somebody else, uh, is in some senses to exceed the domination. I want to come back to that in just a moment. As I said, I saw Juliana came to this diary in or around 2016 uh, when the Stanford rape case and several other campus based controversies in the US and elsewhere around ideas of early adulthood, consent, sex, uh, attraction, and assault that uh, were at a peak and will continue to be for the next two years, and I'm sure you're all very aware. Um, and I want to say at the outset that we were greatly influenced by this change in popular public discourses around the topic of early adult relationships. It has formed, in some respects, the way we've approached this 1840s manuscript, and I think it's as well to be in front of that and also to see as a a potential positive. Um, of course, I don't need to introduce this current Beth the Monarch Ogre figure in popular culture, much deserved, Harvey Weinstein. Uh, but in the Weinstein case, I think the Me Too movement or phenomenon, which Rebecca Solomon recently called it here at Boston College, uh, 
questions of gray areas in sense of power um, and leverage of the relationships have been at the center of the Feinstein controversy. They are the Feinstein controversy in a sense. And to kind of illustrate that quote or that idea, I want to um, just selectively quote from a, a longer piece by Rick Marley in the Atlantic in October 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, we're responding to the Weinstein case and the outpouring of accusations that followed it. Uh, she said that the things that happen in hotel rooms and boardrooms all over the world exist in a grey zone where words like consent cannot fully capture the complexity of the encounter because consent is a function of power. So again, coming back to this idea that power is fundamental within how we might read uh, even the most intimate of relationships and in some senses intimate relationships that we don't see that are not visible in, in the public. So for Marling and theorists like Tilly and Brown, uh, female consent epitomizes to some degree individual subjection in liberal society. In other words, consent, to give consent, is an acknowledgement of one's own inferiority or subjection, of having lost the game that is really against you. This was made really clear to us recently in the Kavanaugh hearing, where widespread opprobrium and public disapproval resulted almost in zero gain uh, for a woman at the center of a Christian. As a four, whose testimony was uh, widely witnessed, widely uh, understood, and of course we all know that it resulted in almost no change whatsoever. So there's a sense that uh, consent is an issue of the moment, the one that is somehow frozen in time. Uh, and it's very much an opportunity that we approach this time. So moving from the present to the Atlantic here, right back to the 1840s, which is something I actually know something about, um, I want to begin with a quotation from a different diary, one that was examined by uh, a brilliant scholar called Leonor Davidoff, uh, who passed away two years ago in the 1970s. And this is the diary of the Victorian maid servant uh, Hannah Cullick. Hannah Cullick's diaries were published uh, in association with a series of analytical articles done by Davidoff in the 70s and 80s, uh, and this quotation is from early 1863, and it's a direct statement of non-consent. Can you read that? Or no. Yes. Okay. I mean, uh, sorry. If you offer to touch me again, I'll do something you won't like. So go your way and I'll go mine. This is in response to a series of advances made by uh, the head of the household in at the time. And I want to just sort of introduce that as a direct statement of non-consent because there's going to be nothing as direct as that for the following 45 odd minutes of, uh, in the diary that I'm going to discuss with you. So, tonight I'm going to talk uh, about four things. I'm going to describe the diary itself, which is in the Dublin Archives. I'm going to describe the two people at the center of that diary, James Fitzgerald Kenny, James Christopher Fitzgerald Kenny, who we're going to call JCK for short, for obvious reasons, um, and Mary Louise McMahon. Uh, I'm going to describe their affair. That's going to take us probably about 20 minutes, half an hour to do that. Uh, it's a tempestuous affair full of almost adolescent drama, uh, and it's good fun to read, which is just as well. And then I'm going to talk about consent and the whole question of the sexual script and how we might understand the norms of sexual behaviour in 1840s Dublin when there's so little written on that uh, and how we might establish a baseline for understanding the fairly controversial um, material that is held in the diary. Okay. So. so this is the title page of diary we're talking about. You can see James Christopher Kenny. He changes the spelling of his own name, which is very helpful. Uh, frequently here he spells it without an E, mostly he spells it with an E-Y. Uh, the diary runs from the summer of 1840 to about November of 1841. Uh, it's an incredibly detailed handwritten diary. Um, and it was purchased by Trinity College Dublin in the mid 90s. Nobody in Trinity College Dublin, of course, can remember why it was purchased. Uh, but we have it, and 
Judy and I are the first people that ever systematically do any work on it. Um, it's more or less been sitting there since. 624 pages in total. We've now digitized it but haven't transcribed it fully yet. Our estimate is that it's 300,000 words, so it'll take us a while and a good bit of money to do that. We've transcribed about 20% of it so far. Uh, it's in reasonably good condition. You can see already from the image that there's quite a bit of detail even in the title page. And what marks this diary out as really special is the extent to which the author has illustrated it, both with maps, drawings, portraits. He's a sort of an amateur artist, and he invests a huge amount of time in the combination of this thing. Here's how he opens the diary. I'll read this out since I don't think you can there. From the beginning of this volume uh, to July 20, 1840, is copied from diaries kept at the time. The originals are of too large, precise paper. All that follows is original. A diary kept at the time is mentioned. A copy was made in April 1841 when I first conceived the idea of making my diary into a book, or at least first set up doing so. I give you this disclaimer in order to introduce the JCK as a somewhat an unstable narrator. It's hard to trust him. He has compiled this uh, diary uh, very deliberately. And he's already at the moment of doing so, conceiving it a bit almost as a sort of a pot butter Victorian romance. So we need to demonstrate some caution when we approach uh, a piece of work like this. It's at least somehow imagine its own audience already. So James was the printed author. Uh, James, I don't know, he was a law student in Trinity in his second year when the diary begins, uh, coming towards the end of his second year. And it's a good advertisement for how much time a Trinity student and undergraduate might have in their hands because it's extraordinarily detailed, as you can see in these two sample scans. Um, he records all of his travels minutely. Every canal trip he takes, every train he gets on, he records the time of it, he records the moment, how much it costs, what happened in the journey. It's as if in somebody had GPS tracked an 1840s life. Um, there is almost nothing we don't know about his life from reading the diary, it seems to be. So, further than that, he also goes back at key moments of his life and recreates uh, quarrels or arguments or love scenes that he has had with his uh, other half, Mary Louise McMahon. And he subsequently codes in exactly where she said what, where he said what, and draws a map that gives us a key of the entire event. It's an extraordinary thing to read for this one to look at. And you can see an example of this uh, on the left here, which is a little map of Stephen's Green in Dublin, which some of you know quite well. <coughs> I entered at Dawson's Gate, uh, Dawson's Street Gate, we went up to Walk B to Bench 1, where we sat down, and after that we went down PAH to Bench 2, where we had a sort of quarrel. The diary is littered with this sort of stuff. Every key moment is mapped out for us. It's also been written just as the OSI maps, the survey area maps, have been published. And helpfully for us, JCK is also a wannabe cartographer. So he copies out the Oregon survey maps in color of every single house that he visits, every single streetscape that he goes to. So this is a, a map of uh, the Grand Canal Dock in Dublin, taken directly from the Oregon survey maps. Uh, Again, there are many, many instances of this throughout the diary. Well, this is just a more close detail of uh, Stephen's Green as it was laid out in 1840. This was one of the particularly bad arguments. So, the relationship is conducted in secret, uh, nobody's aware of it, through an elaborate uh, network of her friends, Lizzie Kelly in particular. Uh, and post office clerks to facilitate uh, incognito posting. Uh, Mary and James meet by appointment. Um, they meet their court in, directly in public, usually in the South City, or in semi private, usually in places that could be considered public, therefore, if they were caught there, it would look so bad, uh, but were in actual fact semi or more or less private or deserted. So, until I read this diary in Trinity College archives, I didn't know that where 1840s couples would go to Canoodle and Court in the 1840s war was uh, a place like Monkstown Botanical Garden, uh, 
or less likely, Mount Jerome Cemetery, which seems to be the place of choice for a couple of years. Uh, which seems a bit dark. <laughs> what else did you about the diary? There's a remarkable double correspondence coded right through the diary as well. So not only does he record every single quarrel that they have, and everything she says, and everything he says, it's awesome. He also copies all of her letters to him over the course of the year into his diary, like a sort of maniac, right? 95 letters in total over the course of just every year. Uh, so we have every word uh, written to him from her. And you can see two examples of it here, uh, written out in his own hand, so he's, it, it's all in his writing, uh, not directly pasted in there. Uh, but this affords us pretty remarkable insight again into quite an intimate relationship Here we have a detail just from one of the letters, this one from the early ones, just early in the affair in September 1840. We don't have all of his letters to her, but she frequently calls parts of them back to him, especially when she disagrees with him. <laughs> so we have a decent amount of that too. Another feature of the protagonist, uh, James, is that he is a social snob. So what he's particularly interested in at all times are grand houses and uh, famous people that he meets, as well as anybody who he considers to be more socially above him. So what he does is whenever he visits a house that belongs to somebody he knows that he's impressed by, he not only records the outside of that house in sketch form, but he plots the inside of that house. So don't ever invite him to your house is what you heard from that. Uh, so the image on the left here, which I'll show you closer to at the moment, is his own house, actually, Stradbrook House, which he and his father rents for the summer of 1840. And we get a, a precise indication of where every uh, room and whose room it is and what bench is in that room. And so that we can, should we be willing to do this, in fact, recreate all of the scenes from the diary in the houses themselves as they take place. It's good in the digital and these projects. Uh, so, just to give you a close-up, this is Haddington House in Dunleary. This is the, the next house his father will rent. Uh, it's no longer extant, but we get a very precise detail of what it looked like at the time in the 1840s. So, again, it's all valuable stuff. This is what the inside the house will look like. He does this for every house he visits. Okay, one other aspect of the diary that's nice that I would draw attention to just in general terms is he also records everything he reads. Uh, every novel, every non-fiction book, uh, every newspaper, everything he buys, everything that he borrows from a circulating library like Greens. And uh, here he is writing to Mary. I'm not going to read all this out because it's very long, but it gives you a sense also of a genuine intellectual connection that they had. Uh, it's very sweet. It's also quite one-sided. He's sending her all the reading materials to show off what brain he is, as 21-year-olds will. Um, so here he is saying that he just sent Lady Morgan's woman and her master to her, but she didn't like it. That may be tactical for Mary to be very bad to show a certain deference or passivity, but I know. Either way, they correspond about it. She shares, shares her thoughts, he shares his. Um, he pretends he reads very few novels, which he says here. Center of the book, I read very few novels, that's a lie. He reads almost the big book novels. Right? But of course, he's too proud to say so. Um, I'm going to read out a short passage just to give you a sense of his social snobbery as well as his certain emotional immaturity um, so that you get a sense of the person. She does love me, and I, do I not love her? Why should I not love her? What though she is only a dancing master's daughter? Her soul bears the impress of nature's own aristocracy. But why should the fictitious barriers of society and custom prevent my bestowing my love on one deserving of the love of one far more perfect than me? Should I blush to own to myself that I love her not? True, I would not marry her. What were she of high rank, even without fortune? For were she of rank, I would wed her, and never would, would, would wed rank or anything without love. 
So you get a sense of his kind of high blown personality. His emotional pitch is normally at this level. So when he's in despair, he's right at the bottom of the darkest cave on earth. When he's at an emotional peak, he's floating high in the sun. So, let's describe them a little bit more fully since it's their love affair that we're uh, peeking into. Does anybody uh, write a diary here? No. Uh, if any diary writers, I apologize for this gross invasion of yours. Or your diaries. And delete your emails. This image, which is also on a lovely poster that came you know, for this talk, uh, is uh, the only image that we have of Mary Louise McMahon. It's a relief done by an artist in Western Row, which is copied out by JCK himself. This is the closest we get to a full picture of her, and she is the mystery to us, whereas we know great deal about him, which shows you uh, the way history works. Luckily for us, as well as being an amateur artist and cartographer, uh, James is also a compulsive genealogist. He's obsessed with his own lineage, proving how noble it is, and he does eventually prove that he is in fact a really shy man, which is the goal of every amateur genealogist. So we have his entire line. It's very easy to reconstruct who he is, where he ends up, when he dies, how many kids he has, etc. So, um, James attends Stonyhurst College in Lancashire, which is a Jesuit, um, elite Jesuit boarding school in uh, the Ribble Valley, which I've done a lot of work on over the years. So he's there in the 1830s, and that indicates immediately that he is of a particular set, and uh, he's a landed Catholic gentry. And so he inherits uh, Kilclar House in Portumna in 1852, along with number two Merrion Square, two Merrion properties, particularly the Merrion Square one. Uh, and this is facilitated by the early death of his elder brother William, who serves in Burma, uh, and dies in 1850. His father dies in 1852, also called James Fitzgerald Kenny. Um, and so James is the unlikely uh, second son who inherits. He's related to three very elite Catholic families, in the west of Ireland, uh, the Bellews, his grandmother is a Bellew, the Nugent's grandfather, Riverston uh, Nugent, and he marries into the Cree Lynches. These are all the families that were known between four and 10,000 acres in the west of Ireland. It's all the fifth and rich, more or less, the standard of the day. Uh, he attends Stone Years College in Lancashire, to which he often refers in his diary, and then he turns up at Trinity College Dublin, where he's studying law in 1840. Um, he goes to Lincoln's Inn in 1843, he graduates in 1848, 49, I don't know why he took him so long. Uh, he eventually inherits 3,500 acres in Portona and marries into another 850 in Mayo. As far as I can tell, he never did a day's work in his life. Right? So he's a non practicing barrister, which is one of those great imaginations. <coughs> which really means he has lots of time to write in his diary, which is great for me. <laughs> this is what his family tree looks like. I'm certainly not going to. Um, name this out for you, but I would draw your attention to one name here, which is Anthony Francis Nugent of Pallas, who will make an appearance in a few more slides. Uh, he would eventually become the ninth Earl of Westmead. Okay, so he's born in 1819, dies 31st of October 1877. He marries uh, in 1870s. He's quite, uh, quite old by relative, relative terms when he marries. He's in his early 50s. And he has six children with his wife before he dies in 1877, two of which survive. His heir, William Lyman, uh, serves in the Connacht Rangers, very typical for that landed class. Um, but he's bankrupted in Edinburgh in 1902. I think it's gambling. It's not clear from the court case exactly. Um, so he ends up losing the bulk of the property in his family, uh, as often happens. His second son is much more successful. Uh, James, he becomes Minister for Justice under Cosgrave. I'm going to show you an image of him. Uh, I'm going to dwell on his career, right? and he's third from the left here, uh, sort of a slightly morose, bony looking fella. Uh, he's not very old in this photograph, so he's born in 1878, and um, here he is in 1928. So, uh, by all accounts, a largely ineffective Minister for Justice, um, mostly famous for coining the phrase. Fitzgerald Kenny's cows when he defended the 
police brutality um, in his reign as Minister for Justice, um, and that was generally made So, anyway, there he is. This is uh, probably close to what he looked like, James uh, Senior. Uh, this is an image done by another person in age 26. We should say this image here is his self portrait. So it makes him look a bit like Wolf Tom. Hmm. Um, here's an image done by somebody else. He's 26 in this image. Uh, this is, uh, I found this in his genealogical file in the National Library of Ireland, which he compiled himself. Uh, so at the time of the diary and the action that's taking place, he's 21. He's won two <coughs> Vice Chancellor Prizes, 1840 and 41. He's a bright young man, a gifted amateur poet. Um, and he has a slightly odd relationship with his immediate family. His brother's in Burma fighting for the British Army. Uh, his father's usually either hunting or traveling, he's just in peace, he's usually down the country, not really present in his life. And his mother is terminally ill. Uh, she'll eventually die in December of 1842, uh, roughly about two years afterwards, um, most of the action. Uh, but the Earl was dominating the second half. Mary is much more difficult to trace, and that's important for the content of the diary as well. You've already seen that JCK has noted that her father is a mere dancing master, so not of the same social class as him at all. And indeed, the only reason they meet each other, uh, which happens in his grandmother's house, is because she's been sort of hired as a minder for his grandmother, Grandma Riverston. Uh, so she's a sort of a an elite level servant, or uh, somebody who in any case has to work for her key, but isn't considered anywhere near as lovely as uh, the same name uh, in that household. So her father is a human man, he's eventually bankrupted in, in the 1840s, that may be partly why she's out of the house. Uh, and her mother is seven years dead already at the point in time in the dark. Uh, she, she's a copy, Mary copy, from Carl. It may have been that JCK's mother was in fact a friend of Mary's mother, and that's how there was a connection between the two families. It's not clear to either myself or Juliana yet, but that might have come from where she ends up in his orbit. She seems to be a sort of companion for his grandmother. She also seems to be teaching his sister Julia piano, so she's kind of a mix between a maid, a helper, and a governess in that um, She will later take up work in the course of the diary in two countryside houses near Tullow, County Carlo, working for the Uplines in the Lens. And she also spent some time in the in Tullow, the Virginia Convent. She's about 25, I think she's born in February 1816, at least I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, she's born in Dublin, registered in St Andrews. It's clear that she's from a lower social class than JCK. It's clear that her family is somewhat in disgrace. Her father is not considered a uh, very proper person. Uh, so she's vulnerable in this scenario. Her family connects to some prosperous New Warish families, like the Coxes and Chesterfield family and Brewers, uh, that have some ties to the Coxes. And it's in those new money households that she's circulating for most of the time that she's in Dublin once Grandma Richardson fires her over later. And this, as I said, is really the only image we have of her. Life after 1843 is a complete mystery to us. We've been working on it for a year now, uh, but it's, it's been impossible to find where she ends up. Which leads to all sorts of doomsday scenarios, of course. Okay, so what about the affair between these two? What does it look like? Where does it take place? It's easy to track its station. It takes place either in the South City Centre, places like Lower Mount Street, which is Grandmother's house or in Stratford, near Black Rock in County Dublin. So the south coastline, south bay, or the south city. And then for a lot of the time, she's actually based near Tunnel and Carano. Um, and she's circulating within houses around that area. So spatially, we know exactly where all the encounters happen. And we also have these helpful maps. So, Here's their very first meeting in 
July of 1840. I said very little to Miss McMahon, who nevertheless I would much more have liked speaking to for the July 1840, their first This snowballs very quickly. This is already August of 1840, 9th of August of 1840, and this is their first kiss. I'm going to come back to this later on because this is the first time uh, there's a physical element to their uh, meeting. She gave me her hand, but I gently pushed her into the room so that no one could see and clasped her to my bosom. Go off for yourself, she said, and she scarce, if at all, resisted, and I kissed her neck. Lots of different ways to read that, and we'll come back to that and we might unpack what that encounter means. But that happens more or less within a month of their first meeting. Just six days later, I hear again an example of the JC's high flow and emotional state. Uh, here he has, as far as he's concerned, fallen in love and captured his beloved. And now at last I am happy. <laughs> now at last, the doubts and fears, the suspicions and anxious longings from which Sunday 26th of July have possessed and tortured me, all departed, and secure in the love of that pure and high heart, I am happy, most happy at last. Bless her, bless her, the angel, for the dear words that told me I was loved. Okay. So a little over a month later, we have mutual professions of love. We're all set for a beautiful 1840s romance. It doesn't work out that way. Partly because James is so hot and heavy at this point, uh, Mary decides to pack herself off, or her family decides to pack herself off, uh, to Tullow in County Carroll. Now, I'm a leash person from Queen's County, as I've already articulated. I've never had the passion to defend. Um, so we obviously have a public in Carmody in general because we border it. Uh, but Tullo is, I think it's fair to say, a fairly nondescript Midlands town. I can say that because I'm from near lots of nondescript Midlands towns. And Mary is accordingly very bored there uh, for the next five or six months. The first place she goes is the Brigidine Convent. Doesn't enlist as a bishop or anything like that. She appears to know some members of the order. But they certainly put her up for several weeks, and she's corresponding with James from there. Uh, it's hard to speculate exactly why she ends up there, but it may partly be because there's been such an acceleration in the relationship that she needs space to retreat to. She also appears to be back in relatively um, home territory. So she spends some time in a hard lodge later at that house. Uh, she's with the Lennon family. See to connect her mother's family and her mother's people. Likewise, the O'Brien and Nara house. Now, these are kind of strong farmers. They're not particularly rich uh, people. Certainly, nobody that would be going to study or study anything like that. They're relatively rich farmers. They're not particularly uh, wealthy uh, members of the local gentry. Uh, and it's between these three buildings that she will largely be based until uh, January of 1840. And so all those letters that James is transcribing into his diary are coming from those houses, uh, where she appears to be, again, acting as a sort of a companion or minor to the women of the household who are either giving birth or are ill in some way. Um, because he can't see her, he copies out the map of where she is and or quizzes her. <coughs> Extraordinary detail of her exact which building she's in and so on, and then copies them all uh, into his diary, which is again great for our purposes. He mistakenly thinks that she's in a hat lodge, uh, which is the, the larger of two properties, which is actually just over the river, slightly in a slightly smaller new build house from the 1840s, which is less impressive. Okay, so all is still well at this point. This is kind of October of 1840. They met in July. Uh, she's away. 
They can conduct this passionate love affair by letter. Everything's relatively safe. Until a sequence of rumors start to circulate about Mary and her sister and their conduct and behavior in Dublin. Um, these rumors reach the ears of James's father and his little sister, Julia. And they are only too happy to relate them to him, and he's only too happy. That's when the whole thing begins to unravel, and these questions of propriety and secrecy uh, in his debating for his dominant become significant. So here's the first hint of that. This is from the 10th of December in 1840. Julia told me tonight what Papa said to Grandmama of Mary. What he said the officer told him about his knowing Mary as well as he could know Annie. And then it, later in the same letter, it's an extraordinary letter, it takes about four pages. Uh, I know I'm not handsome, but the honors I've won in Stonyhurst and in college prove that I have the brains. And a man who has brains has certainly something to make him deserve of love. Here we get a sense, like a sinister point of view of his character. I never signed my letters, lest she might bring them up to me in a loss. Okay. Right, no. Now we're in this like different character portrait of our protagonist. So, there's an interesting backstory to why he might not have signed his letters. There's a recent uh, series of publications in sort of popular novels of protagonists who were brought up in incorrect marriage suits and so on. So it was a, a topic of popular conversation at the time. Uh, but nevertheless, it's sinister and also calculating and sort of unforgivable that he's thinking in so cynical or clinical the term of his love affair. And it tells us something. Okay, so there are rumors about her previous relationships. Uh, the two the figure most probably in those rumors are a man called Mr. Coulter, happy to have Tracy, and Mr. McCall, who's almost certainly Mr. John McCall, and uh, who will later write a letter in defense of her virtue to James. This is how bad this gets. So as those rumors are flying around and he is beginning to confront her with patches of them, they hatch a plan to meet each other. This is done at Mary's instigation, which is interesting. It's not James who suggests this. But she spots an opportunity, marooned in Tullow, to get as far as Blessington. It's a small town in Wicklow, about halfway between Tullow and uh, With her brother. Her brother is visiting her for the week down in Tullow. And she spots an opportunity to travel with him because she loves her brother so much. Uh, as far as Blessington, on a mail coach, she will depart from him then and come back to Tullow. At least that's the plan. Here's how she articulates the plan in her letter day. This is the hotel that they will meet at, which is still there, uh, more or less in the original big uh, Don Shutter Arms. My brother will be returning on Monday or Tuesday of the week. I've been thinking of going as far as Blessington with him. To that, no one can object. The caravan stops at the hotel for fresh horses at 10 o'clock, and again on its return to Tullow at 5 in the evening. My reasons for thinking of such a thing, she says, very properly, was that I might induce you to ride out to see me. I know it's a long ride, 11 or 12 miles, but then you would go nearly as far to hunt, and you once rode from Stratford to Tallinn just to see me. Mm -hmm. So this is on New Year's Eve. Okay, so this meeting happens, and this meeting will define the rest of their relationship because it is scandalous, it's a scandalous meeting. It happens on the 13th of January, 1841. James, after correcting her by letter, and in fact it's 20 miles right from his house, it's real charm, uh, says that he agree, will agree to meet there, and he does. The only problem is that he gets there, 3.30 p.m. They have a really romantic encounter. They meet each other in the kind of front drawing room and so on. It's all very uh, cinematic. <coughs> but there's a problem with the weather and they're both trapped there for the night. Mm -hmm. So according to the diary, and no reason to doubt it, they uh, stay in the hotel in separate rooms. There's a really awkward argument over the bill, but he doesn't have enough money to pay for it. So he has to promise the innkeeper the hotel here. Uh, in an excruciating exchange that he will send him the money, which he eventually does, in a very precise copy of the entire um, And 
they part. But he returns, of course, he had no permission to be out of his family home for the night. To absolute scandal, his father erodes, his grandmother erodes, the whole family erodes. Uh, he's banned from ever seeing Mary again. They had suspected the affair, and they told him to stay clear of her and so on. She has no immediate consequences for this encounter. She's not particularly missed at home uh, because she's not kidding to anybody she's staying with, uh, and her brother doesn't find out about it. But there are long term consequences for her having been so exposed in terms of pride, which we'll be very next day. So, this is the 19th of January, just six days later, uh, and this is Mary writing to James. You have accused me of every species of infamy. It was not enough that you charged me with having been the victim of seduction. You also charged me with having had a liaison with Mr. Coulter, and oh merciful God, with what have you charged me regarding yourself, with attempting to seduce you, and with attempting to make you a cloak for my infamy. James, I send you two letters, read them, them carefully. You have made accusations, barbarous, infamous accusations. Still, still, I love you. Ah. <laughs> okay, so this is January 1841, six days after maybe. You will discover you have wronged me, she goes on, for your suspicions as to the cause of my increase in size. I can thank God you will charm her. No matter at what sacrifice. I will, under any circumstance, I owe to myself and to my family. I, so I will submit to undergo the most strict, most minute personal examination. Which she does, remarkably. She sends him a letter from two physicians based in Tullow, one in Tullow, one in Cargo, who had examined her to see if she was pregnant. Here is the letter from Thomas Burnett. From Jonathan Payne, two local doctors. Uh, it's a beautifully written little note, but it indicates that she has, is not, has never been there. So, this is an extraordinary correspondence. It's all happening in secret. Nobody else knows about it but these two. So, it's remarkable to see this unfold. Here's James's reaction The certificate says she never was pregnant, but it does not say she. I don't like Mary's insisting on the examination when I said I believed her. A modest garden sees like anything to avoid. I believe her in January 18th. Okay, he's not impressed. Comes across as a real piece of work here. And there's no question about that. Okay, so somehow they recover from this. But this is not the end of the relationship. The relationship will still be happening in 1843. Here we are in March of 1841. Uh, he finally accepts her explanations for the nothing that she's done. Uh, after a letter comes from Mr. Coulter, and it's all taken to be a terrible misunderstanding. My poor dear Mary, I must believe she loves me. It's James. There is pique and slight resentment that regret in her letter, but more love. Yes, I love her too, as fondly as ever, though the first novelty and spell be flown away. I love her as fondly as a sister. I cannot love her with the whole devotion of my soul. I never could marry her. It doesn't stop him continuing to correspond with that. By June of 1841, it looks bad. They meet in May, in June, they meet again in September. She would rather be my slave than the wife of anyone else. I told her I would much like for her to marry on the offer of a good proposal. But she said no, she could not think of marrying. Their correspondence dwindles into this sort of frozen uh, space for much of the rest of the year. Okay, so this leads us, me, to a couple of uh, kind of big queries around consent. It's helpful, I think, to think of them both as acting out roles, both of seducer and the seduced, within their correspondence. So we're not apportioning immediate blame or suspicion of one or the other. We need to stand back from it and sure, think about the material. At least that's what we're trying to do. So, what they're doing is uh, uh, scholars of sexual violence and consent would call is that they're acting on a seduction script or a sexual script, most easily defined uh, as ways of knowing how to behave in sexually defined situations. 
sexual script is culturally determined, allowing participants a median of expected um, uh, behavior from which to be able to deduce a sort of a baseline of um, what is accepted and what isn't accepted. Mm -hmm. And to which the judge conduct of their partner. So in the midnight extension, the section of script will have presupposed much of the artifact reading. Uh, Mary's avowedly female passivity, which she signifies to James in every letter, her intellectual deference to his opinions, and her acknowledgement of an inability to physically resist his advances are all standard features of the courtship ritual in the 1840s, nothing to be shocked about. Um, likewise, James's active physical pursuit of Mary, his insistent physicality in her romantic encounters and exchanges, and his foisting on her of his intellectual real are all again expected parts of the sexual script. The power wielded by James is proactive, Mary is reactive. Again, nothing unusual in that. So what I want to do for the rest of this talk is I want to look at four moments some of which correspond to that section of the script, and some of which do not correspond to that. And I want to try and learn from, particularly the ones that don't. Okay, so I'm going to look in again at that first kiss one more time, and in greater detail. I'm going to also call it an assault. And we can decide afterwards whether we think it is or not. I'm going to look at an assault on Mary by another person, Anthony Newton. Ninth or was me. And I'm going to call that song number two. I'm going to look at the Blessington encounter. Again, the one today. Um, and I'm going to call that song number three. And I'm going to look at, you know, for good measure, one last one. And then I'm going to seek your thoughts afterwards. So, here's the first case. <laughs> This is happening in his grandmother's house on Lower Mount Street. The house no longer exists, but it would look just like that one in the background. Yeah, which is next door to I seized the moment for going when I heard her whisper the man going to the parlor. While hearing me run downstairs, she came to the back part of the door to bid me goodbye. Again, very precise directions. She gave me her hand, and I gently pushed her into the room so no one could see, and clasped her to my bosom. Go off to yourself, she said, and she scarce, if at all, resisted, and I kissed her neck and then her cheek. And then bending still more forward, for she timidly turned away her head. Imprinted upon the dear lips I have so often pressed in my dreams, the first kiss of my love. It was half returned, at least it was permitted. And years may roll away before so perfect a moment of happiness shall again be mine. All sorts of interesting elements of language within this. This is a kiss that was extracted for his pleasure, his consumption. Uh, it's one that is insistent. She tells him on a number of occasions that she doesn't want it to happen. So it's difficult for us again to pick really what seems to be a very obvious assault in some respects to try and figure out how it might be processed by both actors in the moment. We know that the relationship certainly survives this encounter, and that will become important when we look at the second assault, which is by a different man, but in the same house. Okay, so happy in the summer. That's their first case. Here's the Anthony Nugent event, which is referred to three times in the diary between August and September of 1840. Anthony Nugent is James's uncle. He's his mother's brother. At the time this assault takes place, he's 35, and he has seven children and a wife. Okay. So the first James hears of this is in August 1840. That she quarreled with Anthony Nugent and told him he was very impertinent, saying to me, Did you not observe I did not shake hands with him when he came to tea on Sunday last? It's the first hint of the problem. So he digs into this. I never get the story of her quarrel with Anthony Nugent, but I could not succeed. She, however, said that she was so little he was so little pleased with her as to call her a vixen and a fury. And then he finally finds out. That day she said that Anthony Newton went to see the house before Grandma went to it. He looked into Grandma's room and said it was a nice one, as also the back bedroom. Then he said, which is your room, Miss McMahon? She replied, both. He asked her to go show it to him, but she refused, going down leaving him where he was. Their quarrel, quarrel which I coaxed out of my mouth, was this. He came into the drawing room 
sat down by her side. Then he put his arm on her chair, and on her moving it away, round her waist, endeavouring to kiss her, she started from him, flung her book at his head, and went and struck him, asking him how he dared to insult her. He got pale with anger, and called her a vixen and a fury. He could not have imagined, he said, she was such a fury. Okay, so that's happening around the same time, a little bit before she meets Jane. And what's interesting about this is, of course, that she does physically resist this. This is her version of the event, of course, uh, which then casts the first encounter with James in a slightly different light. Because she doesn't do that to James. Okay. It complicates how we read it. No more than that, maybe. Uh, what also we can tell from this passage is just how vulnerable a woman like Mary Lou McMahon is around uh, lecherous, opportunistic, middle-aged men like Anthony Nugent because she doesn't have a family of any respectability who can fight her case, and she's alone and somehow isolated in this household. In which case, James might have proved a kind of a welcome way out of all this. Uh, okay, let's return to the encounter in the hotel, which I've spent many months thinking about. Uh, here it happens, uh, sorry, she said it was the 12th of January, I seated her on my lap, which she had great objection to, and I observed whenever my arm rested on her stomach, she pushed it up. She also said that Mr. Lennon had observed she was ten stone weight and was getting fat, and certainly, as I told her, her neck seemed fatter. She said, however, no. I placed my hand on her bosom. She sighed and entreated me, I thought, without affectation to remove it, and on doing so, seemed really rejoiced. I was glad of this, as it said Julia's story was a mistake. Okay, okay, two physical acts that are unwanted and resisted to some degree uh, by Mary. What's interesting about this series of things that he admits to in this encounter is mostly involves them kissing and staying up until the middle of the night talking in a romantic way, is that both of these appear to be a sort of a test. He's testing the rumors that he's heard in December on Mary physically checking if she's pregnant, and he's also uh, trying to test how she reacts to him and to that. And he's judging her reactions according to those rumours. So there's more going on in the event than just a, a young man who's trying his case uh, physically, or trying to physically overpower uh, his interest. And there's more going on than her just resisting it. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to come to any sort of firm conclusion. But it does certainly depart from the norms of Victoria, uh, that it's happening at all. It's very unusual to think it's happening in a hotel. As far as we know. Okay, so this is a sort of moment of, you could say, negotiating consent. She is very vulnerable. The only person that knows she is there is James. There may be a great deal of way in how she's reacting. Exposures. He has her reputation entirely in his hands as he makes these advances. Here she is referring, they constantly come back to this moment and they come back to this encounter in Blessington because it's the key moment in their relationship. I would not allow you to attempt such a thing, you will laugh at my saying I would not allow you, but indeed I would not. It is true. If you went to try your strength against mine, I could not prevent you. I hate myself having made such temptation here. She often plays this role in their correspondence. And lastly, just to show that this pattern persists despite all this, when they meet in May of 1841 in Monkstown Gardens, which he had to be uh, maps for us, uh, he says this I sat down on the seat and forced her gently, interesting construction of that, <laughs> to sit in my lap, which she was unwilling to do, but at last consented to. All of their encounters in Monkstown. Jerome Cemetery followed this pattern, a sort of an initial resistance and then a relenting in some way. Again, not unusual to think that fiction that would be the case, it is unusual to see it play out in real time um, and to see her so forcefully resist it again and again as well. This is the Monkstown Botanical Gardens, which is living beside the moment. This is the castle of the Vatican. A lot of their um, 
leading points take place in this abandoned battle. So kind of funny this is there. Okay, so it raises uh, this big question that I began with again from the kid, and I'm going to conclude very shortly. Um, which is three big questions about all this. Um, so here we come back to this question of power, who has it within the relationship? How that leverage manifests itself and what that might do to how we might mean consent in a historical romance like this, which is what our goal is. This is so we're going to try and understand that sexual script and how it's playing out. What is it? How will we go about constructing that baseline? currently apparent behavior. So the first question that raises itself is where are the guardians, where are the responsible adults in all of this? Uh, how typical is this level of romantic freedom that they're enjoying at the time? Romantic freedom is one way of putting it. Uh, who is seducing whom and, and to what end? Right? Which is the core question in any dramatic relationship like this. Uh, so, um, for a very good reason, man, Consent is something that arguably can be given by her outside the normal strictures of Victorian uh, respectability. She has an errant, disgraced father who has no interest in her as far as I can see in the environment at all. He's sort of ethically compromised, which exposes her. Her mother is dead. She has no older siblings to take the place of moral guardianship. Uh, so she has a great deal of individual autonomy, if you want to use that word, in some respects, from a low base when it comes to her decision making consent in this relationship with James. Her movement, which is in the city at least, is much freer than most women her age, 25. She's able to move around the suburban environment very freely in the 1840s. And that facilitates this clandestine relationship. It's in the countryside that she finds herself restricted and their relationship with hers. James is likewise unsupervised. Her, his father's not around. His mother's sick in bed all the time. His older brother is in Burma. And he's got two younger siblings. So he's also facilitating a great deal, also by being a student in Trinity College Dublin, which gives him an excuse to go into town every day and they can easily meet up, which they often do just outside the Inn and walk around town all day. The second, how typical is this level of romantic freedom? That's difficult to reconstruct, and it's also difficult to, to make large assumptions about. So, for example, um, trying to spread it out from just Dublin in New England. It wasn't at all untypical for young couples of this age to have this level of freedom in their lack of supervision of parents. Yeah. So in Boston, in, in the equivalent time in the 1840s, this would have been unknown for middle class and middle class couples. Uh, lots of work has been done by L.K. Rothman on that. Likewise, Martin Lyons has done lots of work on French couples in the 1840s, uh, which shows that the rest of correspondence between couples was relatively rare. Um, Letters sent between couples presupposed that third parties would have access to them and read them, and thus there was a huge amount of parental supervision over this type of relationship in, uh, in France at this time in the 1840s. Written in Ireland, historians, when they looked at this issue, have typically argued that the early Victorian period was a particularly free one for couples of this age and class. Uh, but this diary sort of flies in the face of that, or might do, might not, might reinforce it. The last question. Who's seducing whom? So we're going to end on inconclusively. Um, relates to this question of, of social capital and what's that gain from the relationship. So Mary's social capital is clearly less than that of James. Uh, she's older than James, she's 25. She has a great deal more experience of romantic love than he does. Uh, and of course, her disgrace would have been total if the details of her courtship had become common knowledge. But so too would it have damaged James. She's quite intent about defending her honor and does so very directly when he questions it. The opportunity for Mary then, if we stand back and look at the relationship, is that a relationship with James that would lead to marriage would offer a great deal of financial stability and also a respectable entrance into upper middle class and elite society um, in their regional circles. By contrast, James stood to gain very little in material terms, yet continues the relationship beyond the point so he's trying to make it happen in some respects by all the time denying that he will ever marry her. That's why he declares it so often in his diary. His family would have disapproved of the match uh, and he certainly uh, 
is taking a chance. So the question of who's choosing who is therefore important. Our focus on the Great Diary is entirely on Mary as doctress with a financial moment, uh, motive would appear from the diary at least to be grossly unfair reading of the dynamic of work in the relationship. Mary is in fact quite vulnerable and there would be room for a sympathetic reading of her behaviour even if you did see it as intentional manipulation of changes given her precarious financial and social position. Equally, the idea that James, a socially awkward and emotionally immature young man or diary, could be cast as a knowing cad, a seducer or a rake, seems far-fetched as well. This appears to be his first relationship of any sort. He's candid about his insecurities related to his attractiveness and otherwise, and he certainly appears at least to be as interested in Mary's opinion and mind as he is in her body. And yet, he behaves abominably. So, the diary raises all sorts of questions about the grey zone that Britt Martin talks about in relation to the Meinstein case. It raises all sorts of queries about power and unfair leverage to be in an interclass relationship. But I'm going to stop talking about it now and try and harvest what your impressions of it are and hear your questions on it. Thank you very much for your attention. Transcribe all of her letters, but as I am pointing to your story, so far, 
he will, in some of his entries in the diary, he'll say, he'll either give you a spirit of it or he'll transcribe paragraphs of it if they're particularly contentious. And then she will quote them back to him. Very interesting. I gave a talk, I'm going to give two, two other talks on this. I gave a talk in, in Nova Scotia. And that particular element of the diary convinced at least half of that audience that he might have been inventing here. <laughs> Which I have to say is, but it was an intriguing theory that she could be a figment of his imagination. But uh, what she was. Yes. In those 200,000 words, does the church religion ever enter the discussion? Uh, they both go to Mass every Sunday and talk about that. Beyond that, they're not particular. They're more interested in the life of the body than the mind, at least it seems to be. So, so no, um, they're both Catholic. Um, she attends Mass regularly, he attends Mass regularly. He tends to record whatever attractive woman he saw at Mass, <laughs> including a long four day fascination with a woman he calls incognito. Person, the first mistakes for his Mary Louisa in Mass, and then follows around Dublin on horseback, and then continues to see her every now and then. That's not the first time he's done that in that 300,000 words. So, so, no, he's not particularly religious. It doesn't involve, the only time he invokes God is as a mantra at the end of every entry from most of 1841, where he asks God to spare his mother who's dying. So he says, God spare her, God spare her. That's the end of, end of every entry, which is interesting in itself. Uh, but no, he's not, he's not especially religious. Seems like he has a, like you said, a lot of time on his hands. So what did you pick up on what John was saying? Does he, does he write about anything else? Is he, does he commenting on politics or law? Or, uh, yeah, so he writes a lot about his own accomplishments <laughs> yeah. in Trinity. Uh, he's interested in genealogy, so he writes a lot about that. And the other things that he mostly concentrates on uh, he loves hunting, so he does a little bit of that with his dad um, when his dad is around. And then he's, what he's brilliant for doing is recording any journeys, plus the transport systems. And, you know, the railway has just appeared, so that, that's very strongly figured in his, in, his, in his writing. He doesn't seem to spend any time in Portona, the whole place, really. So he's Dublin based, and he's a kind of self obsessed 21 year old. Uh, he's more interested in his, what he's reading. He's, he spent most of his time with the maternal side of his family and he discusses books a lot with them. So his intellectual life is university based and he reads with his mother, he reads with his grandmother, he reads in conversation with Mary. So he's quite a bookish young man. What, what's he reading? Uh, he's reading all sorts of things. So I actually have, uh, you can see in this, in this slide. So he's reading Lady Morgan. He's, it's a classic diet, I suppose, of, that you would expect. He's reading Shakespeare. Uh, he's reading. Sorry, no, it's just like, it's yeah, it's so he's reading the Exiles of Palestine, certain Orientalist texts. He's reading Emily, the Countess of Rosendale. He's reading Lady Morgan's Woman and Her Master. He's reading any fashionable novel that comes up, and he must read at the moment. And then he reads a fair bit of history because of his interest in genealogy, and because his dad likes, he likes to impress his dad. Uh, so he pretends he's interested in history, but he's really interested. And he pretends he's interested in serious novels, he really likes historical romance. Yeah, so right throughout the text, everything he reads, where he gets it from, how much it costs him, who he buys it from, where he sells it on to, all of that was in there. It's, it's amazing. It's yeah, I also thought about the invention. <laughs> that was kind of instructive. Is it real? Fun Punch has interested in the previous two questions. What about peers? Uh, his peer group, what do you do? Do they refer to friends of, in their age, same age group at all? Or? Yeah, so, so one thing that he does is he records every culture event he goes to, any opera, or any, any concert. He likes music. So who he notices when he's there is anybody richer than him, or any of his old school mentions. So he'll mention them whenever he meets them. He doesn't seem to have a very close circle of friends. He's not, he's not writing to them. He has a very large family that he is in correspondence with, including the Uncle that is uh, he writes to him reasonably often. Um, the biggest thing in his life is, is his mother. He seems to be almost a sort of a carer for her. Um, but yeah, he doesn't appear to have very healthy. Uh, I don't, it's hard to judge him. So he doesn't spend a lot of time with her at the end of the stage. 
and the middle of the very last female friend. Which is a double she is not. Yeah, so, so her best friend is Lizzie Kelly, who facilitates the areas of the relationship. She's the daughter of a confectioner and a crafting student. Um, she seems to be kind of a, uh, a lively, fun character. She seems to live also in a huge amount of independence for her 25 year old. She lives in a, a separate accommodation for her family, also near the crafting street. She's doing a lot of the very wrong with her letters, very wrong with the relationship with her boys and her babies. She fades away. She's kind of sent to the countryside. Exiles herself first and then to the family sends her away and keep her all her trouble and see if she can. They agree that they can the character. So yeah, so yeah, I mean, I'm wary of this too. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a historian, but it is interesting to see that like, he has very deep relationships with some people, but yeah, his social life seems truncated.
that she is that she is in fact. So she traces exactly the time that the letter could get from Tunnel via the mail coach to the able to because this other course is just is a very odd young man in every way. Uh, but yeah, so, so I think there's enough to enough to be satisfied with that uh, from my point of view. It's a great question. It's certainly one that occurs to me. Yes. Okay, um he's fairly clear that he doesn't really foresee that he's going to marry her. So like he's fairly clear about that. But has he told her that he's ever in like he a woman and he's just like, yeah, I'm not gonna marry her or that and then next time he's like, is she pregnant? Like I mean it is a bit much, yeah. He, so he he did, he talks openly about that from sort of spring of eighty forty one that Mary was the day of the Before that he constantly speculates on that to himself, but he doesn't say it to her. So he's dreaming her along this in the dream for long March of eighty forty one. After that they have quite frank conversations about any possible future that can be between them. And she certainly knows that her meditation with his family is very very common. Um, so they might be waiting until his mother dies. And very often, a rupture of one parent leaving allows a relationship to come in uh, and back into decency, if you have respectability. But that still leaves his father as a problem. His grandmother dies. So they may be they may be just buying their time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so I don't have a simple, I don't have an easy answer for it. He is eventually honest with her that he doesn't see a future and a relationship. Weirdly continues for another year and a half, things that happen. So maybe in the absence of a better offer for her. So you have this situation kind of compromised? Yes, he has something on her before, he said. Yeah. And he, he always feels that way. After blessing him, he feels he has he really has the upper hand. Uh, with the idea of her level kind of dropping out of the her specifically and the fact that he's gone back and annotated things, do you think that he ever removes her agency? Like the fact that if you had a full set of their correspondence not annotated that you see maybe her, you know, have these conversations about books that he always brings up and maybe he's leaving some of these things out, but that, that her uh, does stand up and defend herself at certain points comes through, but he has to put those in because that's how they need to be for their story to progress. So for, yeah, but for a lot of it, do you think that he's at any point gone back and removed? You know, as I agree with you that he can't really, he's not capital to kind of think all this up and chase her on his own, but I think that there's a possibility that he's gone back and kind of moved her agency a little bit to be like, oh, I, you know, I'm just a poor looking man, but I'm still ruling this relationship. Yeah, I suppose if he, if he was clever enough to do that, he wouldn't leave it so he looked so bad. You know? <laughs> yeah. His conduct is shameful, and he lets that stay there. So, if he's able to come back two years later and not still see that, so he says, hey, well, I my conduct, he doesn't strike it out, he doesn't take it out of the target. And that, that maybe argues that, you know, he isn't capable or hasn't wanted to go back and change it. I mean, one speculation, and this is just a speculation, I'll say this time over, is that he so disregards her character or more, he so regards himself superior to her, that she remains a sort of plaything for him. And she just is a character in not only showing him. Like that has certainly occurred to me sometimes. Uh, which would flatter me even less than I have to others. That's my answer. I can't, I can't answer the unknown. Anyway, um, on the one hand, women are completely vulnerable, she's totally vulnerable, but on the other hand, she is uh, strong and experienced and able to assert herself. But is not, is it, could it not be the case that she's all, that the societal norms also enable her to assert herself to a degree? Uh, for example, that she's able, you know, if she was economically vulnerable in this house and Eugene goes for her, she throws a book at him, but she's able to do that in the assurance of societal norms that if it is discovered, people will take her apart. So it's not the case she's not entirely as, as vulnerable uh, as that. That's number one. Number two is, well, these assaults, it's permissible these days to say that they might be able to remember it. Mm -hmm. And similarly, this affair, what was the level of their intimacy physically? Yeah. 
He so kisses her on the cheek, maybe on the lips. What? How far? What? What? Yeah. So what else? So there's no evidence. There's no evidence in the diary that they ever had an anal sexual relationship. Very small thing. Very small. Yeah. No, that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure the argument that they are the same sex. Because what I'm trying to the cheese for is uh, you're quite right to point out that she can she can assert herself. She does very directly when he calls her on her in the question. And she shows that she has a certain arsenal you know, in some respects that she can call her. So if publicly you need to defend herself. So she's willing to go and see two doctors to assert her purity. Um, but she has to do that in order to keep the marriage prospect alive with him or anybody else. She's also leveraged into those situations. She's reacting to those. Uh, just like she's reacting there's almost sort of an innocence to his advances, his physical advances, in that he's not, he's not experienced enough or being old enough to make the legends of sort of the future choice. He doesn't have this, he doesn't seem to have that in him. He doesn't do it. So, so, so the question is, yeah, like, if he's trying to play the noble, gallant heroes and love them, at what point is he failing? And how is she trying to steer that character? So other things concerning context, if you uh, take your point with Tom, Tom Richardson, is the genre of the time of the silver silver war, which we should investigate. But then, of course, as well, I mean, uh, uh, presumably there are people who do seek to research and um, relationship mores in the eighteen forties. But the term Victorian, I don't know, is a bit problematic to me because it covers the whole sixty more years. In the early 1840s, you know, when we think Victorian, uh, we, have, we have a set of expectations which have nothing to operate in here. Of course, who else was searching for to see whether somebody intimately connected them with the pregnant at the time, at exactly the same time? Queen Victoria herself, in the Lady Flora Hastings case. Do you know, is it yeah. yeah, I think it may be exactly precisely which would increase the idea that this is a novel, that Lady, Lady Flora Hastings was in the employment of, of Queen Victoria's so lady waiting. And she began to put on weight. And Queen Victoria, because she was terrified of the reputation her uncles had had, for lecturing and Queen Victoria was no clue. She used to talk about sex all the time with Lord Melbourne. And, and she was no clue ever her. But she, she was terrified of this. Uh, and, and she took, um, uh, unit of measures against uh, their Lady Flora Hastings, it turned out not to be pregnant, but to have cancer, and she died. And the whole thing would go off into the Victoria space. So at exactly the same time this is going on, there's a nationwide public signal that was known about, about uh, um, pregnancy or no pregnancy, which would indicate, which would uh, increase the idea that perhaps, as you were saying, maybe there's a novel in the world. Yeah, there's also a series of reflect off the court case, he was suing for. Uh, damages on the promise of marriage, ginger scotch. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea of not writing your name in a letter is that's a prudent thing. I wouldn't say it's a lawyer, total cat, doing that. That was a very significant discovery. For goodness sake, half the stories of Sherlock Holmes were about that that somebody's ruled by someone on the letter of their name written 20 years before. It was not a name. It's not, I would not think that some of the, some of the causal things you take to task for are not quite as bad. Yeah, oh, it's good to have one JCK apologist in the room. Uh, <laughs> so, who can chase his name? Is that not loading it? It's just because of the name. He changed his name. It's not about loading it in against him. He's a series of masculine initials. No, but she's not. Yeah. I mean, I was just inside the analysis here, and so should you. Thank you, we should thank James and not you, James, but James. <laughs> <laughs>